Good evening, everybody. I'm James Goody Allen. This is the Digital Age. They say there that Chuck Schumer knows no Sunday show he doesn't like. And guess what? He likes Digital Age. We finally got under his radar, or in his radar, I should say. We have Chuck Schumer here tonight to discuss, are the NSA leaks legal? Chuck, thank you very much for coming Glad by. Glad to be here, Jim. Really a pleasure. I've been watching these Chuck shows, uh, these Chuck shows, these talk shows. Well, the same thing, Chuck shows, talk shows. Uh, with Close, but not enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> Condoleezza uh, Rice goes on after the NSA leaks come out, and right. she says, I'm not a lawyer, but right. I, so I think the leaks are a good idea. I mean, not the leaks, that the wiretapping is a mm -hmm. good idea, and so I want to put it to you. You are a lawyer. Right. Are the NSA leaks legal? Well, we just don't know enough about who they who they tapped and who uh, what was the rationale, what was the justification. We do know one thing: that almost always, when the exact you know the balance between security and liberty has been a delicate one for 200 years. The Constitution, the Founding Fathers, that was the number one thing they talked about. And it changes in wartime. It changes in terrorism time. There are doctrinaire people on the left who say it should never change. That's not realistic and that's not, not what's going to happen. But when you have these disputes, almost always the way it works best is to have an open debate about them, set some rules, and then have an outside arbiter, usually a judge, a federal judge who's appointed for life so he or she has some independence, monitor them. What the president did and his people was totally different. They didn't have any debate. They didn't set up rules. They just went ahead and did it. So were, did they circumvent the law? It's likely. It hasn't been determined by the Supreme Court. They have a theory. But one thing is for sure. They would have been a lot better off going to Congress and saying we need this help. It's also true that what they say is that they had no choice is incorrect because the FISA law, which governs this now, allows you to go ahead and wiretap somebody and then go to court later within 72 hours and say we needed to do this. So you didn't have to wait. There was no delay or anything else. So, and I have an interesting question which I'm going to ask Attorney General Gonzalez at our hearings, which are Monday, and that is most of the conversations they tapped probably were in Farsi or a different language. How long did it take to translate them? <laughs> because if they didn't translate them immediately, this need that they had to do it immediately or couldn't go to court uh, goes by the wayside. They uh, have not said that they have tapped uh, digital conversations through the uh, internet and through email. Right. Uh, just sitting as a citizen looking at it, I can't believe Frankly, they could be so stupid to have this program and not be tapping emails. Do you, you know, have any view on that? Yeah. Look, first, the constitutional protection should be the same for one as the other. Um, second, obviously, uh, if you're trying to find out terrorists talking to people in the United States, which is what they say, and, you know, that's a reasonable thing for a government to do, um, you'd want to look at any means of communication. But the great problem we have is they're giving out no information. We don't know how many. Was it five people? Was it 5,000? Was it five million? How careful were they? I don't think anyone would object if they had a suspicion that someone was an Al-Qaeda member and talked to a citizen in America that that conversation should be tapped, particularly after 9-11. How many of the conversations were that, those, and how many were not? And what was their justification for them? And then they say, well, they follow the trail. So if that Al-Qaeda person talks to someone and then he talks to someone else, well, how did they follow that trail? When he was talking to his mother-in-law, did they listen in? I mean, these are all questions out there. The one thing I would say is this. I'd say most Democrats understand the need to do this. But we think we can have strength protecting ourselves and rule of law. The president and the vice president in particular seem to think that they're in contradiction. I don't think they are. And the fact that they're not is the beauty of our country. How, how do you play this politically, assuming that uh, you come to the conclusion after you've heard all the evidence that, uh, as most people have, and as most lawyers have, no lawyer, two lawyers ever agree on anything. You and I will never agree on right. anything. We're that's, lawyers. That's the job of lawyers. That's the job of lawyers. <laughs> but it's probably fair to say, if you look at all the lawyers around who've talked about this, probably 80% of, of the lawyers believe that it's uh, illegal. Pete DuPont, yep. who's a good lawyer, for example, does not. Right. And there's some good lawyers on the other side. Yeah, you, and that's what you, but 
everyone, it's sort of like blind man's bluff right now. Right. You don't know exactly uh, what was going on because we don't know how many people, who, under what circumstances. Did they just say every phone call? from right. Pakistan or Afghanistan to the United States should be monitored. These are all things we don't know. I would say this, uh, that the, you know, so you don't know, there were people within the Justice Department, hardly civil libertarians, but if you can believe Newsweek magazine, people like Jim Comey, the premier prosecutor, terrorist, anti-terrorism prosecutor in the country, uh, this fellow who's a professor at Harvard Law School named Goldsmith. Comey was the deputy attorney general. Goldsmith was OLC, Office of Legal Counsel. And even John Ashcroft, according to a New York Times article, again, we don't know, um, had, had real doubts about this. So the odds are there were problems. Okay, so now let's just talk about the politics of this because, to go back where I was, 80, say 80% 80 of the lawyers, Comey, yep. uh, so forth, think it's illegal, okay? But when you take a uh, poll of the American people, it appears that 53% of the American people believe not that it's legal or illegal one way or the other, but that it should go forward. Right. In other words, they're mm -hmm. in favor of the program. Now, it depends, but, by the way, how you phrase it. But I no know, matter well, which way you right. phrase it, you'll get it either 50 50, or if you phrase it the other, other way, way, you, you get actually it. get 70% for it and 20 or 30% against it. All right, it. so now you're uh, the head of the senatorial. Democratic yes. committee trying to raise money for senators, trying to change We're the balance. We're trying to get a Democratic balance Senate. Balance of power. Now, one would have thought, at least on the East Coast, hey, this is a slam dunk issue. Wiretapping without a warrant. There was a law you said you couldn't do it. We've been it before, no question about it. You've given a very measured response today. Some of your colleagues have been less measured, saying it's flatly out illegal. How do you say that it's illegal and uh, try to make an issue of it for yourself when the president and the public don't seem to be with you. Okay, here's how. I think you have to make clear whether you think it's illegal, not illegal, or questionable, um, that you believe in strong security. In other words, the first thing the average American thinks about is, are they going to protect me? They know it's a brave new world out there. We've lived through 9-11, Madrid, London, and they want to be protected first and foremost. That is not an irrational belief. And the doctrinaire people on each side, far left, far right, say, oh no, it should only be liberty. Oh no, it should only be security. There's always a balance, and we know that. It's true in criminal justice. It's true here. So to say that Democrats want to make it clear that we want to protect Americans and we're going to go to every length we can to protect Americans from terrorism, I think is our shield, is our antidote. Then you take it from there and you say, but we want it done within the law and we want to do it done with the checks and balances that have been the hallmark of this country since 1789, our nation's founding. And I think that can work. The thing we have to make clear, here's, Bush has a great attack machine, and so does the hard right. And what they will say, this is what Pat Roberts said yesterday in the hearings, that our Democratic friends, I thought this was outrageous, but you got to answer it because it's out there. Our Democratic friends are more angry at George Bush than they are at Al-Qaeda. To sum it up, we have to make it clear, we're more angry at Al-Qaeda than George Bush, even if we think George Bush has stepped over the line, which many Democrats do. Okay, so if you say that uh, there's the hard right and the hard, hard left, and there must be some way to deal with it in the middle. That usually means legislation. Yes, exactly. So, all right, now, do you think that you could get legislation to uh, deal with the issue that is bef before no us? No question. First of all, in 1987, I think it was, there was the FISA law, which dealt with this issue. And many believe FISA would have dealt with it this time. 78. 78, sorry, got the numbers back, inversed. Um, in 2001, after 9-11, in the Patriot Act, Congress extended FISA. They changed the balance. The balance of FISA was more on the side of don't use information for wrongful criminal prosecutions, more towards protect our security. Um, there is no question to me, if the president came in and made a case, it doesn't even have to be a 100% case, but just, you know, a case that 
there's a chance that if we don't do more, it'll increase the danger to American citizens. Congress would have granted him some changes, but we would have done it in a rule of law way. As I said, we would have had a debate, we would have set some rules up, and then we would have had an independent arbiter look at the rules. Here's the example I use all the time, which shows this can work. Uh, uh, wiretaps. Before 1971, there were virtually no rules. The prosecutors could wiretap anyone they want. You had all the abuses, which finally peaked when you heard that J. Edgar Hoover was just listening in to political conversations that he didn't like. Congress passed a law. And what it did is, first there was a debate, then they set rules, probable cause, you needed probable cause to get a wiretap, and third, you had to go to an Article Three, an, a, an independent arbiter, a judge, to uh, get the okay. Well, we've had this law for now 30 years and change. It works. The prosecutors say it works. They wouldn't want it changed. The defense lawyers say it works. They wouldn't want to change. We can do the exact same thing here. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the timing, because the Patriot Act is sitting there. It's been extended. Just was extended last night. The, the, Patriot, the Patriot Act had some reference to the FISA court in its amendments. I don't want to go into them, but yes, I'm just trying does. to point out that the Patriot Act yes. is a logical place to do what you've been talking about. Right. but. The Patriot Act is sort of held up. So the political question is, will you, will the Democrats, will those who don't believe wiretapping is legal as they've done it, hold, hold up the Patriot Act until we get uh, compromise okay. legislation that well, you're talking and about? And now you're going to get into the issue you asked me about before, which some people may not like to hear about. If we were to hold up the Patriot Act, let it lapse, then people would say you're leaving us insecure. Because there are lots of things in the Patriot Act. I know there are certain provisions that are objectionable, and I've worked to change them. But there are lots of things in the Patriot Act that there's virtual unanimity that were needed and are needed. And to let them lapse would lay us bare naked. So what we've tried to do is say, let's extend the existing Patriot Act with its flaws rather than have nothing. Now, there are a few who say, let it lapse altogether. I hate it. That's not. Uh, accurate reading of the fact. So what we will try to do is make the changes. The trouble with the wiretaps is what changes do you make when thus far the administration hasn't even yeah. shared okay. with us what they're doing? So it's going to take, take, so some, it's time. Going to take a little take more some, time, time than a month and a half. But I will tell you this, we're going to be relentless in figuring out what they're doing and in trying to correct it. Okay, and now correct let's it in a careful way, a measured way that's aware, not just of the political realities, which obviously exist, but of the substantive realities that, you know, we're in a dangerous world. Let's talk about an issue that's connected with what we're talking about. Porter Goss said yesterday, uh, first of all, that the press effectively had damaged national security. Our enemies know more about us than they did before. I don't want to go into that. But he also, he also said that what I would like to see is a grand jury convened, and I want to have the reporters there to testify for the grand jury. Do you agree with that statement? Okay, well, let me first answer. I'll say three things. First, just a little anecdote. I live in a little brownstone, a block and a half from Capitol Hill. I still sleep downstairs, share this, you, you know, with somebody with all, else. All those but I no longer <laughs> sleep on the couch. <laughs> Guess who our neighbor is? Ooh. Porter Goss. He oh, was Porter a neighbor Goss? when he was a congressman. Really? So we have now at our house 24 hours, seven day a week protection. There are always these CIA guys, you know, security guys right. outside our house. They're even there when Goss isn't there because they don't want anyone to go in and plant bugs or something like that. Okay. Number two, his statement uh, that the press leaks damaged security. Yeah. I can't see that. I read the New York Times story and other stories. All they say is this wiretapping went on. There have been 500 stories, my guess, certainly large numbers, before this story to say that Al-Qaeda doesn't know we're trying to. There were stories in newspapers that Al-Qaeda is no longer using cell phones because they know we're tapping them. So the damage would have been if they mentioned specifics. They didn't. And I think, frankly, the New York Times was very careful. They waited. Some argue too long. But they waited. They were careful. I think that is really an unfair statement, and Portagas is wrong. As for finding out, 
when, when classified information is leaked, you should always find it out. I have no problem with that. We have to set rules, and we don't have good rules, and this relates to the Judith Miller situation, it relates, you know, the Plame situation and others. We're going to have to revisit the rules on what leaks, you know, what, on, on leaks and a shield law and everything else. But I have no problem with if any classified information is leaked to find out it, who leaked it, what damage it did, and what the appropriate punishment right. and is. The and the executive branch is entitled to do that. No question. But what's looming on the horizon, perhaps, is a huge press crisis where you could have uh, New York Times reporters and maybe even others all called before the grand jury. And now, this is really an important source case for them. Okay. It's a whistleblower case. Yes. And uh, you well, may, it might have a is huge, exactly. huge Jim, crisis, and something ought to be done about This is, yes, and this we have to do. I am not a purist on this issue. Many of the journalists say any, no reporter should ever be questioned on where leaks come from. I don't agree with that. Grand jury leaks are used by prosecutors to create unfair trials. Talk to any defense lawyer. There's no justification for leaking from a grand jury. I didn't think there was any justification of leaking Plame's name. So a reporter protecting that source stands on far less strong ground than, say, the reporter who's protecting someone in the FDA who sees them fixing a yeah. test it's not a whistleblower on a drug. Case. It's, it's not, not a whistleblower right. case. So what we, exactly, yeah. what we have to do in terms of the shield law protecting reporters, which I think we have to do, is distinguish between the whistleblower case and other cases. But to just, the, the reason the legislation that many say on the New York Times were pushing got nowhere, it was, it was blanket. And there are many of us who believe in the First Amendment, who are hardly right-wing conservatives, who think there are some cases where there is not a justification. Well, so would you agree that if we have to look at whistleblowers differently, and here we have with the NSA leak case a classic whistleblower case that if we had a shield law, we ought to protect the, the press in those okay, kind of cases? I, you know, again, until you know the facts, it's hard to get into the specific cases. I do believe we have to protect whistleblowers. I would say this, though. There are different standards with whistleblowers involved with classified information, where it's more dubious, even if they are a whistleblower, and whistleblowers with non-classified. Whistleblowers with non-classified, easy. Non-whistleblowers with classified, easy. The tough case, and I don't have a good answer, it needs to be studied, are whistleblowers with classified information. What is the definition of whistleblower? how sometimes things are classified for good reason and sometimes yeah, things are classified to keep them secret. This is an area that needs some careful study. Let's talk about, uh, as we were at the beginning, with respect to what we're going to do about the NSA leak in terms of legislation uh, and how you deal with your job as a senatorial, uh, can I call it a money chieftain? Yeah, I think that's you probably that's that's a fair fair description. <laughs> and let's let's go to. A, <laughs> I'm not agreeing. My <laughs> silence does not signify assent. Uh, let's talk about Alito a little bit. Okay. And uh, uh, the vote the Democrats had yes. was 20 vote. Uh, Democrats voted to uh, filibuster effectively. 25. Yeah. 25. Yeah. Uh, now Alito, if you look at the uh, CV. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a very good CV. No as question. a lawyer, as, as yeah, a lawyer, course, you know. Of course it is. Yale Law School, da 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 yep. da 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 uh, He's personally uh, not bumptious. No. Nope. Uh, and personally honest. And personally, personally honest. Now, do you think that uh, you make the right political decision when you uh, vote against him? Not just vote against him, but campaign against him? Well, camp yes, I do. Here's Even why. though you lose? Yes. Here's why. The courts, well, I'm going to take a step back. This is going to take a minute, but as you know, I've been active here and given it a lot of thought, which I'd like to share at least a little of which with you, given the time constraints. I think that the hard right in America, composed basically of two groups who allied in the late 90s, one are who I'd call the theocrats. These are people of deep faith. I respect faith. I've been in enough inner city Baptist churches, working class Catholic parishes, Orthodox Jewish synagogues. Faith is a beautiful thing, but they want the faith to determine what our government does. That's un-American. Joined by another group. I call them the economic royalists. These are self-made business people who don't want the government to do anything to them. Don't take their taxes. Don't tell them they can, can't pay less than minimum wage. Don't tell them they can't pollute their 
Okay. They combined, and in the late 90s, they had this great idea they should take over the courts because they couldn't get their way, which is basically to take America back to the 1920s or even the 1890s um, in the legislative or executive branch of government because American people are fundamentally moderate and our politics is decided in the middle. And they're, they're, they're on their way to doing it. <laughs> and we will regret it for a generation. So I believe as soon, it's, it's hard to do it ahead of time, which is what you have to do in the nomination. You know, you say, Alito is my guess, will overturn Roe v. Vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's your guess. That's my guess. Most, when you read the polls, most Americans say he won't. 70% or 68% of Americans don't want a judge who will overturn Roe v. Wade, but only a third or less think he will, because they can't believe he would do it. Same with other things. Turn back the Commerce Clause so we have right. no federal regulation. You lay the predicate now, and as these decisions come out, they will and should have a political effect. So to just roll over and say, the guy went to Yale Law School, is a smart guy, is honest, let him go through, which is what the ABA does. That's why their ratings have lost some of their, not cachet, but used to be, had the ABA rating, you became a judge. Now that the judges have become so ideological, I don't think that works. And I'm the one, I'm the progenitor of the view that we should question them about their ideology, which is now accepted. It took me three years, but it's accepted by everyone. But you lay the predicate and people will see the effect, and it should, they should. And that's part of, part of it. I would have liked to block Alito. I argued within our, our private councils that we should filibuster Alito, this is even before the hearings, if we could, based on his record and what I think he would do. Uh, because of the hearings and other things, that didn't happen. But continuing to make the record, I think that is the right thing to do substantively and will inure to our benefit in the medium and longer term politically. Let me, let me ask you a question about his first vote. Roberts, yeah. if you're a close follower of, of this stuff, and I don't suppose the audience is, but us lawyers are, yeah. Roberts is voting with the conservative right. block. He doesn't, it just looks like it's, you know, lockstep. Well, it's, it's a few votes. Too well, early to it's tell. It's too to tell, but uh, it surprised me a little bit anyway. It did. Me too. But now Alito. Yeah. He's barely, barely on the court. Yeah, he votes he's the other way. He's sworn in, uh, you know, yes, one yes. day, and the next day, <laughs> all of a sudden, he's voting the other way. What do you yeah. think of that? Too early to tell. Too early but, to tell? You know, the argument that some make, Arlen Specter made this. Look at Souter. Everyone thought he'd be a conservative right winger. Right. He wasn't. Those days are different. In those days, judges were not thoroughly vetted by the right wing ideologues before they were even nominated. Now they are. The likelihood is strong. Unfortunately, I wish it were not the case with every atom of my body uh, that he will be a very, very conservative judge in the mold of Scalia and Thomas. And, you know, the right-wingers say, well, Bush said it in the campaign, and he won. He said he's appointing judges in the mold of Scalia and Thomas. I would argue, A, that's not why he won. <laughs> that was not where all but, you know, maybe 5% of people voted on that basis. And B, when he said that, people didn't quite know what it meant. No one wants, maybe 1% of America wants to get rid of the Commerce Clause and go back to, you know, the federal government being in a pre-1932 state of power. You know, I'm tempted here to ask you about your comment about uh, the information highway, which has uh, back ways, back alleys that you see tons of crime in. But you know what? I'm not going to. Okay. We've, we've had a digital issue because I look at wiretapping as a digital issue. It is. So instead, I'm going to ask you, as the senatorial, <laughs> what do we call you this time, the king? Uh, <laughs> Far from that. <laughs> uh, you're trying to get the Senate to be democratic of the upcoming yes, elections. Yes, I am. I am. Are you going to win? Well, it's an uphill fight because the geography is bad. First, the geography is tough in the Senate anyway. Even Ameri although America is even between red and blue, the big states tend to be blue, the little states tend to be red. So we have 30 red states and 20 blue states. So if each state elected just, it'd be 60-40. Number one. Number two, the, race, the Senate seats that are up this year are bad for us. More Democrats are up than Republicans. And uh, the, even the states where Democrats are up tend to be red states. We have very few Democrats, incumbents, and blue states running. Having said that, I'm optimistic that we're going to make good progress. Taking back the Senate, that's a big job. Stars have to be aligned exactly right. But even if we were to pick up three seats, 48 in the Senate could block Alito, whereas 45 pick can't. Up three seats. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What Can are I tell you yeah. the, the difference? This is very hard to even convey 
the feel for it. The difference of the Senate being 52-48 and 55-48 is huge. It's not a 3% difference. It's so you get, much if you're 52-48, do you get the right to, do you have the power to subpoena the administration? You still no, don't have the power to subpoena the administration. You, you only, instead of needing to pick up six Republicans, you only need to pick up three. It's a lot easier. Can I ask a question which is outside your Senate water? Sure. But I mean, you were a congressman but once, so right? We, so, we're, yeah. so we're having good luck. So we're good having luck. good luck. We're raising, I'm working hard at this. I'm not raising a nickel for myself. Uh, we've raised more money than the Republicans, and we're giving it out to the candidates who need it. We've had a great recruiting season. So we are poised to do much better than anyone ever thought. And the public's getting tired of George Bush. They really are. Even with this recent string of so-called victories, the election in Iraq, Alito, his numbers continue to be very, very poor. And this is somewhat typical of the second term. President, mm -hmm. this election should be a Democratic election in theory. Uh, quick, quick, God, yes. quick comment on uh, the House. Yeah, the House has a chance, too. It's different in the House. Was this, what, on the one hand, the big wave affects the House members more than the Senate members, because Senate members are sort of more known to their people. On the other hand, the House districts are so gerrymandered, it almost gives them the geographic disadvantage that we have. So you're not predicting that the, the, the Democrats will, will... Look, it's too early to predict. I would tell you this, if you just look at the public polls, if the election were held today, Democrats would have 50. It would be 50-50. 50-50? In, in the Senate? In the Senate. The we're poll? ahead, we're ahead in five states where they have incumbents. They're ahead in no states where we have incumbents or blue states. However, that gain says a lot. Claire McCaskill, a great woman Democratic candidate from Missouri, is ahead of talent by four points. But he has $5 million in the bank. She has a million dollars in the bank. Well, you're going to get the rest for it. Well, I hope. But when, she st when he starts spending that money, he could reverse things. But right now, people are favoring us. The House has a new leader. Yes. I don't know much Bain about him. I don't know much about him, but when you look at his photograph in the paper, you say, you know, sort of in superficial political terms, well, that looks like an attractive guy. Is this going to he help is. the Republicans I think a lot so. at least? It was yeah. my judgment that of the three, Boehner was the best of the three. He is the most substantive. And he's the most willing. It, this has become very partisan town. Okay, we're come to an George Bush is partisan. The Senate leadership is partisan. The House leadership is partisan. Of the three, he's probably the least partisan who ran. Okay, now I'm going to ask you the question we asked at the top, just to refresh everyone's recollection of what we were talking about. Are the NSA taps legal, yes or no? You can't answer yes or no until you have the facts. <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. Thank it's you very much, Senator Schumer, for nice coming by. Nice to see you, Jim. Thanks. And thank you for coming by and come by. Next week, to learn more about the digital age, for the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night.